morning folks another fine day for a brake job don't you think we've done front and rear brakes for the range rover we've done front and rear brakes for the kia so now it's time to show some love to the little opal as well and by that i mean it's time for a front brake job now because this is fairly similar in terms of procedure to what i've done to the other two cars I'll do my best to keep this video a bit shorter, but as always, I'll try to include all the relevant details that are needed for this job. In terms of components, I'm sticking to ATE, the same ones that I used for the rear of the Range Rover and uh, all the brakes for the Kia. And as I explained, I do this because they've proven to be good components. They're not sponsoring me or anything, this is just my personal opinion. These coated rotors actually uh, remain in good shape over a longer period of time and they don't show signs of too much rust. And also the 90R certification that you see there basically means that they're within 15% deviation from the specifications of genuine brake components from Opel. And the pads, just as before, are ceramics for lower dust, no noise and longer life and at the time of filming the car has nearly 180,600 kilometers give or take and she's slightly over eight years of age now this car has been driven most of the time outside the city so that's why the original rotors have lasted so long but most likely if you're driving such a car inside the city that their life is probably going to be a bit shorter now before we jump into the work itself i just want to show you something a little bit later you'll see just how worn out the current brake parts are in terms of thickness and in terms of rust but right now before i do any disassembly i'm gonna take the car out for a short spin and i want you to see just how much noise i'm actually getting when i'm applying the front brakes because of their state of wear so here we go here's the brake noise with the old components Okay, I think you can agree that the noise was pretty obvious and that was actually one of the reasons why I wanted to do this brake job in the first place. And with that said, let's get to work. The first step obviously is to remove the front wheels and before that you need to secure the car. Underneath I've used two 3-ton jack stands as well as this absolutely fabulous electric jack which I bought a while ago and it saved me a butt ton of work. This is brilliant, it can even lift the wheel of a Range Rover, so it's absolutely awesome, but enough about that. So, secure the car, and then wheels off. You need 17 millimeter hex to remove the four nuts on each wheel. With the wheels off, let's see what we have. We have a very pronounced rust on the inner disc. That's not necessarily a cause for removal, but it does indicate the age of the component. I've measured the thickness and it's about 19.5 millimeters. Now the Haynes manual which I use for the Opel says that the minimum thickness should be 19 millimeters but on the new Ate discs it says it should be 20 millimeters. So however way we take it these are close or past the end of their life. And also on the inside I'll show you a bit later as well as on the outside I have a pretty pronounced lip that I can fill with my fingers. So these were due removing. Now the pads themselves in terms of thickness, at least the outer ones, still have some life left in them, but uh, we're gonna be discarding those anyways because they're pretty old as well. Next, we need to remove the caliper, which is held in place with two 13 millimeter hex bolts. The one at the bottom can be removed with your box standard ratchet or wrench or whatever for the one at the top because the brake lines in the way you may need a thin wrench or a ratchet with a crow foot extension also works pretty well now after you remove the bottom bolt use a flathead screwdriver to create some leverage underneath the caliper 
like so to make it easier for it to come out alternatively if you can try with the tip of a screwdriver to create some separation between the rotor and the pad either way at some point you should be able to lift it by hand it should be spinning on the top bolt don't remove that one just yet and when it's clear then you can remove the top bolt and make sure to secure the caliper with a zip tie or something like so i've used two thicker zip ties to secure the caliper in place to make sure i don't have any nasty surprises as you can see the brake line is not twisted and it's not under load so that's good next we can proceed with the removal of the old pads and now we need to remove the caliper bracket now the caliper bracket is held in place at the back with two 19 millimeter hex bolts and because we're working on the front brakes, we're just gonna make our lives a bit easier and turn the steering wheel to gain better access to those bolts. Like so. And now with a 19 mil hex and the breaker bar, just slacken the two bolts first. But before actually removing them, do one more thing. Now, it's often the case on many cars that the two caliper slide pins are of different shapes. Because we don't know yet how these two slide pins look like, it's genuinely a good practice to mark which is the top of each caliper bracket so that you know correspondingly which is the leading edge pin i.e. the one that the brake wheel goes into and which is the trailing edge or outer edge pin the one the brake disc goes outside from so because this is the left wheel we're just gonna mark with a marker L here to know this is the top of the left caliper bracket and we're obviously gonna do the same on the right side as well and now we are ready to remove the bracket. That's one bolt out. Don't lose the uh, washer on top. And obviously we need to keep these bolts, we're not going to replace them. Here is the second bolt out. And here is the bracket removed. Now, if you've bought new pads and the set came with new shims, go ahead and discard the old ones. In my case, I have new shims, so I will discard these. But if in your case you don't, then you, these need to be removed, cleaned, and later put back in. And there's four of them to remove. That's it. After removing the brackets, go ahead and straighten the wheels. And next we need to tackle the two bolts that keep the rotors in place. These use a Torx T30 and you can try and remove them with a screwdriver or something but if they're really stuck in I recommend an impact screwdriver such as the one that I have here and I use this in conjunction with a hammer and as I hit it at the back it's slightly gonna spin the head. And after a little bit of effort, here is the first bolt coming out. 
okay? So just repeat the procedure for the other three. And here's the first for me. After I remove the bolts, the disc is just gonna come out without any kind of effort. So no need to hammer it down or anything. But if in your case, you find that it's completely rusted to the hub and it won't move, just simply take a hammer and smack it on the back side here, then turn it a bit, hit it some more, turn it a bit more and so on to break the rust ring inside. It shouldn't take too much effort and eventually the disc is going to come out. Now with all the parts out, let's do a nice comparison between old and new. And just take a look at how the inside part of the rotors actually looks like, especially this one. This one was on the left side and you can see that the surface that actually got in contact with the pad was really thin as opposed to the outside which is much thicker, nearly the entire width. And I had noticed this in the past as well. I could feel this part with my finger, okay? These are two ridges that are caused by humidity, mainly because the disc, while being ventilated, has a much poorer airflow through the inside than through the outside. And here is uh, another one of our cats that came to inspect my work. Seems to be pleased. So that's, that's a good thing, I suppose. So where was I? Yeah. So on that basis alone, and on the way the discs actually look, they were due changing. But for the sake of thoroughness, let's also spend a bit more time to actually measure some thicknesses. So hopefully you can see right now I'm measuring 23.8, but I've also used a washer because the lips of the disc are too thick for me to just use the measuring device properly and if we subtract the thickness of the washer from that value with the thickness being about four point something millimeters okay we get that the actual thickness of the disc is about 19.6 millimeters so according to the Haynes manual we still had about 0.6 millimeters of thickness to go but according to Ate, this is already below the minimum allowed. I measured the thickness of camera for the other disc and it's pretty much the same. So just a quick mention again why thickness is important. Well, the ability of a disc to dissipate heat is directly proportional to its mass. And given that the actual mass of the useful part of the disc is sort of like a hollow cylinder, the mass is directly proportional to the thickness. Okay, so a thicker the disc, a better ability to dissipate heat. Once the disc goes below the minimum specified thickness, it is no longer rated to handle the amount of heat that the car will produce under braking. So on the thickness basis as well, these were due changing. Now let's take a look at the pads. Let's grab an old pad like this. And we have the total thickness, which is, let's say, about 12.3, 12.4 millimeters. And if we now subtract the thickness of the bracket, 7.10, it means we actually still had about 4.2, 4.3 millimeters of actual brake mat material to go which means that the pads themselves weren't necessarily at the end of their life. But if we're replacing discs, it's always a very good recommendation to also replace the pads because the pads have already taken the shape of the old disc. And once you mate them to a new disc, it'll take a while for them to wear down to match the shape of the new disc. And until that happens, the braking performance will not be optimal. By contrast, let's look at the new parts. Here's the new pad. And its thickness is... ...18.2 minus the bracket. 
which is about 6.8 that's about 11 and a half millimeters of pad thickness and if we lastly measure the thickness of the discs here's what i mean when ate says minimum thickness 20 millimeters so take a look the thickness of the new disc is slightly above 22 millimeters and this is perfectly in sync with the Haynes manual that says the thickness of a new disc should be 22. Okay, enough about this, let's get back to the car. Now before we install any new parts, it's very very important that we clean the hub thoroughly so that the new disc will mate to its surface as best as possible. For this, I like to use three things a power tool with a varying combination of metal brushes, brake cleaner, and compressed air. And I've actually been waiting for this moment for a long time because of all the three cars, the Opal uses long screws on the wheel, which means the hub itself has no protrusions and it's much easier to clean. So we want to clean this side, the ring as well, and maybe spend some time to clean the back of the hub as well. You get the idea. Repeat the process until the surfaces on both wheels are clean. And you can feel with your finger that they don't have any obvious protrusions. I'll obviously do the job off camera and come back when I'm done. And here's what came out after the cleaning. It looks almost brand new. I'm really, really happy with the way this thing turned out. I know this is a tedious and boring part of the job, but believe me, it is very important, so do your best to do it thoroughly. All right, now that this is done, we are almost ready to install the new disc, but we have one more thing to do. Namely, we need to apply some brake grease on the surface of the hub in order to prevent the new disc from rusting on the hub in the future and to make it easier to remove. So you wanna coat this surface as well as part of the front of the hub, as well as the side, with a thin, manually applied coat of brake grease. And here is the grease applied. I've used same old Techstar Ceratec ceramic grease. As I explained earlier, I'm not a big fan of copper grease, and this thing seems to be performing just as good. Okay. Let's move on to installing the disc. And the installation is straightforward. The only thing that you need to be mindful of are these two holes where the two small screws go in and the disc needs to align with these, this one and this one. something like this. And now we need to put the two screws in and secure the disc in place. Now, if you haven't bought new ones, you need to reuse the old ones that you previously removed. In my case, I always buy new ones because they're very cheap. M6s with a similar Torx T30 head. Okay, one's in place. And here is the other one. Now with regards to torquing, Haynes manual says these should be torqued to seven Newton meters. However, the ones that I bought are 10.9 grade steel which for an M6 means they can be torqued up to 17, so 17. 
and I'm gonna choose about 14 newton meters. You want to keep the disc in place, otherwise as you try to torque it down you'll just spin the disc. So just use a flathead screwdriver, stick it in somewhere. That's one. That's two. Okay, and with this part done, let's move on to the runout check. And with the measurement gauge in place, we're just gonna spin the disc and see what deviation or runout we get. So it's near zero. Okay, so what we got is below five hundredths of a millimeter, so below 0 0.05, which is excellent because the Haynes manual tells us that the maximum value is 11 hundredths of a millimeter, so 0 0.11. So this is less than half of the maximum limit, which is very, very good. All right, one quick mention here. If, for example, you happen to get a bad runout or too higher value, Keeping in mind that this is a combination of the disc's runout plus the hub's runout, you can always take the disc and reinstall it, twist it by 180 degrees because of the symmetry of these two bolts. Okay, so we just take them out, take the disc out, rotate 180, put it back, and hopefully you'll get a better runout value. But in our case, this is just fine, which is absolutely awesome. And now let us tackle the two caliper brackets. And by that, I mean we need to clean them as well. And ideally also spend some time to clean and re-grease the two caliper guide pins. When cleaning the bracket, the parts that you want to focus the most on are these four, i.e. the parts where the metal shims on which the pad slide get installed. With regards to the slide pins, in our case, if you take a look there, they appear to be in good condition, right? So they move smoothly. This one has some difficulty in moving, but it does move. However, given that I've seen the old brake components last for a very long time, and I'm expecting the new ones to also last for a very long time, I'm expecting to not have to touch these parts for a long while. Therefore, it makes absolutely no sense to not clean these up and give them a bit of attention. All right, as you can see here, there's an R that I wrote. So this is the caliper bracket from the right hand side. And let's see the pins. So this is the leading edge pin at the top. Looks okay. And this is the trailing edge pin, okay? And this is what I was referring to earlier. Take a look at them. You see, the leading edge pin is only metal, whereas the trailing edge pin also has this rubber grommet to prevent vibrations. That is why it's important to know which pin goes where, and that is why I marked the brackets with the letters to know which is the top part. Anyways. At this point, I'm just gonna use the same tools as before. So metal brushes, brake cleaner, compressed air, and so on. And I'm going to get to work and come back to you when I'm done. And by the way, when doing the cleaning, make sure you wear a mask and some eye protection because there's going to be a lot of dirt in the air and rust and brake dust and everything. And you don't really wanna inhale those particles. And here is the cleaned up caliper bracket. I think you'll agree it looks much better than before. I also cleaned up the insides where the guide pins go in. Here are the two guide pins all cleaned up. As you can see, they're in very good shape, no signs of rust, nothing wrong with them. So we will install them back. And I've also cleaned up a little bit the two rubber boots, which are also in good shape in the sense that they're not ripped, they don't have any holes. So we're gonna put these back as well. And for the pins, I use a TRW brake grease. I apply a little grease at the base where the rubber uh, sits on the bolt so that I won't install the rubber 
dry. Then I installed the rubber cap. Like so. Then I apply more grease to the body of the slide pin. Not too little, not too much. And then spread it out in a uniform fashion. And then the pin is ready for installation. Looking at the bracket, you notice the L. And because this is only metal, we know this is the leading edge pin. So this one goes at the top, i.e. on the same side the letter is. So we just put it in, spreading the grease a little bit, pushing it until the rubber goes into its normal position. And that is it. See, it slides well and makes no noise. Next, if your new pads also came with shims, take out your new shims, as is my case, and you want to grease for now the outside of the shims, i.e. the part where the shims actually sit on the caliper bracket. Okay, this is to prevent them rusting over time. Use the same kind of grease as for the pins. And then take your bracket, Take your shims, greased as I explained, and just install them one by one until they click in place. Something like this. And once all four shims have been installed, lastly apply a little bit of brake grease, the same kind, on the inner part of the shims where the pads are actually going to slide on. Luckily, these seem to be wide enough for me to actually apply the grease with my finger. But if you don't want to do that, just use like a brush or a small screwdriver, whatever you find most useful. Okay, and when we're done with this, we're ready to install the entire part. Now let's finally install the caliper bracket. We begin by taking our two bracket bolts. I've cleaned this up with a metal brush a bit earlier. We apply some medium strength thread locker to the tip of the bolt. Make sure the washer is in place, the one at the bottom. Then we take our bracket, see the L should still be visible here. We put it into position trying our best not to touch the rotor and failing. And then we install the first bolt and we tighten by hand as best we can until we can no longer do so. Grab our second bolt, apply thread locker and install the second bolt as well. Now when we can no longer tighten by hand, we tighten a bit more with the ratchet. And lastly, we torque the two bolts to 105 Newton meters as is given in the Haynes manual. That's one. That is two. And here's the tightening of the right hand side for good measure. One. Two. Next, we need to push the caliper pistons all the way in to make maximum space for the new pads because the new pads are obviously much wider than the old pads and we need the maximum amount of space between the cylinder and the caliper edges. But before we do that, I recommend you open the brake fluid reservoir to make sure it doesn't cause any kind of overpressure. This is also a good opportunity for you to check the level of the fluid. So mine is nearly at the max level, which is here. And I'll be keeping an eye on it to make sure 
it doesn't overfill. You don't want brake fluid to overfill because of its corrosion, the fact that it affects paint and it is very toxic. And you can use one of these piston pressing tools if you have one available. If not, a 10 centimeter C-clamp should be just fine. Also taking a peek at the brake fluid level, it's all right. And it's done. I'll do the same thing on the left side as well, off camera. And just as I was saying, see, this is after the right hand side, the level has risen a bit, it hasn't overflowed. But I'm pretty certain that it will overflow once I press the left piston in as well. So I'm actually going to be removing a little bit of brake fluid from here using a syringe or something. And by the way, before you do the cylinder pressing, take the opportunity and study the state of your caliper and the caliper piston and most importantly the caliper piston gasket or seal, this one here. In our case it looks fine, but if you take a look at the Kia Sportage videos, you'll see that I actually had to rebuild the caliper because one of these had actually broken and got the piston itself to rust over time. All right, so now the cylinders are pressed on both sides. I actually needed to remove brake fluid twice from the reservoir because the system doesn't have too much capacity, so be mindful of that. And now we can go on to tackle the pads themselves. But before that, don't forget to close the brake fluid reservoir. Tighten it by hand, not too much. That should be enough. Now with regards to pads, start with this one, the one that has the wear indicator. There's only one of these in the entire set of four. Apply some more brake grease to the both tips. And this one always goes in on the inner right hand side. So right here. It's a wee bit of an effort to get it in, but it gets in eventually. See? Just like that. Now let's move on to the other three, which I'll do off camera, but I want to point out one thing. If you look at their back plates, two of them are like this, and this is a cover which protects a layer of adhesive, whereas the third one looks like this, identical to the back plate of the inner pad. So this one also goes on the inner side, on the left hand side, Whereas for these two, we're going to be removing this cover, like so. And the part with the adhesive goes on the outside. Here we are on the left hand side, both pads installed, and boy do they look nice. And now we need to install the caliper. And for that, let's just quickly take a look at the caliper bolts. The bolts themselves are actually slightly different. They have the same 13 millimeter head and diameter, however, Take a look at them from the front. See, the head of one of them is a little bit hollow. The hollow head goes to the leading edge pin, i.e. the one at the top, and the flat head goes at the bottom. Now, the pad set actually gave us two bolts, which I thought was a bit strange. Why not give us all four? But anyways, we have two bolts, and as you can see, their heads are a bit hollow. So we know that these will always go at the top, which kind of makes sense because when you brake, the load at the top is going to be slightly higher than the one at the bottom. That's also why the top pin is metal, whereas the bottom one has that rubber component. So we will be replacing the top bolts, but the bottom ones will be reused. So I've removed the zip ties and released the caliper. And now I'm just going to put it in place aligning the pins a little bit with it and after a little bit of struggle I've screwed in the first bolt by hand now I'm also screwing in the second bolt and because the space is a little bit restricted for torquing I'm going to use my torque wrench with a crow foot extension and the required torque is 30 newton meters or 22 foot pounds. If you're using crow foot extensions, always put the crow foot perpendicular to the torque wrench. Otherwise, if it's in line, 
the torque that you apply will be slightly different than the torque that you've set. Okay. And that is one. And that is two. And the left side is done. And by the way, I actually love the design of these caliper pins. See? Because they're held in place by their shape combined with the shape of the caliper. So you don't need an additional wrench to hold them in as you tighten. As is the case for the other calipers I've worked on. So, awesome bit of design. And for good measure, here's the torquing down of the right hand side bolts. One. Two. Excellent. Now, let's put the wheels back on. And once the car is back on the ground, don't forget to torque the wheels. The torque is 110 Newton meters and torque in a star pattern. And lastly, put the four plastic covers back in their place. All right, so we're done with the brake installation. Now all we have left is to take the car out, check that everything go right and do a bit of bedding in. But before that, there's one more important step to do. Considering that we've pushed the front pistons all the way to the retracted positions, at the moment, there may be a small gap between the pistons and the position of the new pads. Now, the first time you're gonna press the brake pedal, the piston won't actually reach the pads, it will actually close the gap. But until the gap is closed, you basically do not have brakes at the front. And because you don't want this to happen as you're driving, you need to just press the brake pedal a couple of times and you'll feel it once it gets a bit stronger. With that said, let's go out for a test drive. Now for the brake bedding in part, the procedure that I recommend is to accelerate to about 80 kilometers an hour and then apply medium braking to bring the speed down to about 20 kilometers an hour. Something like this. And then accelerate back to 80 and repeat the procedure for a number of times, say five to ten times so i did it one time and here's the second time and while i'm at it i think you can hear pretty clearly that that noise that was uh, occurring when i was breaking with the old part is well and truly gone so that's very good news and do keep in mind as the ATE documentation recommends in the first 100 200 kilometers do your best to avoid hard brakes or sudden stops and just as we did with the kia let's also measure the temperatures with a simple infrared thermometer the front right wheel is at about 75 degrees centigrade And the front left is at about 79 to 80 degrees. So fairly close to one another, which means that the brakes are being applied evenly and which means that we did a good job. And time for conclusions. And even though I'm going to repeat myself, I will re-emphasize that the quality of a brake job directly impacts your safety. So only tackle this yourself if you feel comfortable, you have all the necessary tools and all the necessary time. Don't rush this job because the consequences if you do it badly can be fatal. And secondly, let's talk costs. I quoted not a dealer, but a garage specializing only in Opals. And they told me that for fully genuine GM parts, rotors, pads, plus labor, they wanted almost 400 euros which i think was for romania at least a very big sum of money considering the car is just an opel corsa however 
They also gave me an alternative of using aftermarket parts, which were on the other end of the spectrum, so quite cheap. And that plus labor was about 150 euros. The cost for me for the parts, going with coated ATE rotors as well as ceramic pads, was nearly 180 euros. So just slightly bigger than the cheapest alternative they provided. However, I used much better parts in my opinion. The discs are not coated, so they would rust faster. And they were using normal pads that would also wear out faster and most likely create more brake dust than these ceramic ones. So in the longer term, I actually think that this solution, the one that I went for, is actually cheaper even than that, because I'm not going to have to touch these components for a much longer time than with standard ones. And with that said, as always, thank you very, very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you liked it and if you liked my other videos, I would greatly appreciate it if you considered subscribing. I wish you all a very nice day and I will see you again next time. Take care and goodbye.